Hi, my name is Sarah Evans and with me today is Kenton Pillay, one of the founders of the Capitalist Party of South Africa, better known as the Purple Cow Party. Kenton, thanks very much for joining us Lots today. It's a pleasure being here. So tell us, what is the Capitalist Party of South Africa? Why should anyone vote for you? <laughs> Capitalist Party of South Africa is, is basically 10 people, all of us business people, who have come together and decided that politics is too important to be left to politicians. So all of us are established, successful business people at various levels. We all currently have jobs, you know, and we're all currently not looking for sheltered employment in Parliament. But we all have real skills that we want to bring to Parliament where we can actually shake things up because we take the view that the 400 people who are currently sitting in um, uh, Parliament, of them, most of them would not be able to get jobs in the real world. So we've put the worst possible people to run the country and we think it's about time that people with real business skills went in there and tried to actually just rock the boat a bit and make a contribution. So what is the biggest problem facing South Africa today and how would you address it in Parliament? Sure, the biggest problem clearly is unemployment. And, um, but unemployment is it's a systemic problem. It really starts with the fact that for the longest time now we've had um, an ANC government, because it's been the majority party, has been committed to this really old and worn out idea of a national democratic revolution, which really is the imposition of an old fashioned Soviet style state where essentially the government is, the, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, Father Christmas that hands out everything to, to the masses and you need to receive it gratefully. And we, of course, take the view that South Africa, first and foremost, is a capitalist country. We're a country of business people, you know, starting from the spaza shop owner up to the mines that uh, generate the wealth of this country. And really what needs to happen is government needs to get out of the way so that business can actually do what we do really well, which is to create jobs. Surely one of the biggest problems facing South Africa as well is inequality and poverty. In a situation where you don't have any intervention from government, say for example in the form of BE or affirmative action, which I know you guys oppose. So we reject totally, yes. How do you address the inequality question? If you have people running the show whose primary motivation is profit. Yes. Inequality is not a problem for us. If you look across the world right now, you've had a drastic reduction in the levels of poverty and that for us is the crucial thing. How do you uplift people from poverty? Now we've already seen that this can be done because during the Thabo Mbeki era, we, at that stage, the economy of this country performed at levels that it has never performed at before. We had superb economic growth basically because Thabo Mbeki and Trevor Manuel allowed the economy to run free. And what they were able to do was to take the profit that came from business being very successful and plow it back into upliftment of people at the lowest levels of society, mainly through, um, through social grants. And the result was we had a drastic uh, movement of people out of the levels of poverty. So just in over a five year period from 2001 to 2006, we had a 60% reduction in the number of people in the poorest of the poor. Then you had Jacob Zuma take over. And the first thing he started doing was to borrow money once again which is something, uh, our debt had been paid off on the Mbeki. Jacob Zuma started borrowing money, and instead of plowing that money into infrastructure, which is what it was meant for, we all know that it left the country on aeroplanes going to Dubai. And now we have a situation where we are spending a billion rand a day in interest payments on the money that was borrowed by Jacob Zuma and company. And we are saying that the only way you're gonna fix that, let business free, so that, and if you set business free, you get all of the laws out of the way that actually prevent business doing what it's good at doing. Then you'll have a scenario where the economy suddenly booms, tax revenue goes up, more people are employed. As more people are employed, they contribute more to the tax base. And once again, you've got money that can be used to actually start paying off that debt, because we need to pay off that debt. The, this, but this entire fixation around inequality, it needs to stop. It comes from a place of envy. Inequality is not the problem. Poverty is the problem. We need to uplift people out of poverty. That means that you need basic levels in terms of education, in terms of clothing, in terms of accommodation, in, in terms of transport. 
And if you have minimum standards that are set for the country in terms of those four things, then a country flourishes. To my mind, I do not care if Patrice Motsepe is worth literally a million times what I'm worth. As long as my standard of living is comfortable and I'm happy with it, do, you know, if he's made his money honestly, which I believe he has, good luck to him. That's fantastic. But we obsess with inequality. If we are trying to correct inequality, we push all of us to the bottom. Let, let's focus on getting us out of poverty. In your policies, you, 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 know, you talk about a meritocracy. Mm. Um, I'm curious to know, the idea of a meritocracy you know, almost has to start from the place where everybody's starting at the same level. <coughs> if you have a society like South Africa where, although perhaps you think inequality is not an issue, surely you would agree that society is very unequal. How do you ensure that everybody is able to start from the same place and that the playing field is leveled so that people can uh, achieve based on, on you know, what their own merits or what their own talents might be? There is no place in the world where the playing fields are leveled. So that's the, the, the starting point for us. What we can do is we can fix education so that everyone has opportunity to get to the same level. But right now we have this totally absurd situation where you have white kids who are sitting with eight A's in matric and they cannot get into medical school. And you have black kids with a 70% pass rate and we're putting them into medical school because we want to guarantee an equality of outcomes. That's stupid. We should be putting the best possible people into our medical schools so that we're producing the best possible doctors because that ultimately is going to ensure that we have the best levels of health care for our country. This idea of trying to engineer the outcome by trying to push back people who are ultimately capable of doing what they can, it, it's absurd. It, it's exactly like people trying to say, you know, Costa Semenya has got too much testosterone and we need to give her drugs so that she's able to uh, brought down at the same level as everyone else. No, that's rubbish. She's the best that she is in the world. You must let her flourish. But we are at the stage where we are taking the best that our country is able to generate and we say, no, actually, you need to take a back seat because we believe these other people are actually worth more. And, and, and the disadvantage of that for the number of black kids who are talented means that they are always judged on the perspective of, is this person here as an affirmative action uh, appointee or is this person here on merit? And it disadvantages the, the huge number of them who are there on merit. Kelvin, moving away from that question for a second, I want to talk about a couple of your other policies. Um, your website talks about your response to violence against women. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, the only response that you seem to offer there, and I'd like you to, to maybe explain it in a bit more detail if you can, is that uh, women and girls should be taught self-defense you know, self-defense lessons they should have at school, for example. We said that they should take shooting lessons at school. Just right. very explicitly, yes. Okay, yes. they should take shooting lessons. Mm -hmm. um, that's all very good and well, but that places the onus on the victim to prevent the abuse, as opposed to addressing the abuser. So where is the accountability we've for been, men in this equation? We've been trying to address the abuser for the past 25 years. And every year the stats get worse and worse. Every year we have 16 days of activism against women and children. If there's a single rape or a single murder that has been prevented as a result of those campaigns, I want to see it. It just has not happened. Now, the thing for me right now, I have three daughters. Okay, my eldest daughter is a sound engineer. She goes out for gigs late at night and she's coming back. And you know the single thing that terrifies me? is the idea that she might have a puncture on the way, it might need to be changing a tire in the middle of nowhere. And right now, in this society, there is absolutely nothing that we have been able to provide in the past 25 years that is giving her protection. And I'm saying that if you take girl children particularly in high school and you train them in safe, competent use of firearms, I'm not saying give them guns, but train them so that they are able to understand when it is appropriate to use a firearm and how to use a firearm safely, then when they become productive members of society, if they so wish, they can go out and acquire a gun. And what I'm saying is that even if one in five women ends up acquiring a firearm to defend herself, that perpetrator is never going to be sure whether that person that they are targeting is one that is capable of fighting back or not. 
This is, this is an absurdly violent country. The guns that are out there right now are there because of the fact that we have a failed government. Most of the firearms that are out there are illegal firearms that were sold by corrupt police officers. Now, we don't trust our government to provide us with proper education. We don't trust our government to provide us with proper health care. We don't trust our government to provide us with proper transportation. But we are saying that we trust this government to be the only people who are carrying legal firearms. No, that's absurd. I don't carry a gun myself, by the way, just if, for the record. If you were to have a situation where more people um, in the country are armed, Surely then you would need to first address, you know, the criminal justice system and the police in general. As you point out, this is where a lot of the problem stems from. There are a lot of illegal guns circulating in the system in order to make sure um, that the situation is properly regulated. And, and that brings me to my next question. Does that not lead to even more government intervention and more government regulation to ensure that, that the usage of guns in the country um, does not lead to a free-for-all where you have mass shootings, for example, like you see in the United States where you can buy a gun at Walmart. Yes, we're not suggesting a situation where you can buy a gun at Walmart. And we're not suggesting anything that's going to downplay the amount of training. We're very firm on the idea that training has to be first and foremost. And it has to be safe, competent use of, uh, uh, of firearms. But the whole question of, uh, of free-for-all, look, government right now is not able to enforce no smoking laws. You know, so their ability to actually control illegal firearms that are out there. And here's what happens. Every time there's a purported amnesty and people hand in their firearms, what happens to those guns? They go right back onto the street, sold by those same corrupt police officers. So I'm very happy with all the hypothetical situations that people come up with. But right now I'm of the view that if we are going to have a situation where people are able to defend themselves against criminals, they cannot rely on government. Now, right now, the scenario is that a lot of us live in gated communities, where basically we have armed guards protecting us. Who are the people who then don't have access to armed guards to protect them? It's poor people, basically. So I'm saying upskill them from the time that they're at school, and if they choose to acquire a firearm, they then have the necessary skills to be able to defend themselves. We are not saying make guns easily available. We are not saying have a situation where you can walk into a Walmart and pick up an assault rifle. You can't do that in this country in any case. You can't buy automatic weapons. Well, not, uh, certainly not in the business of, uh, of, uh, of self-protection. And it, it really is at that level. People <coughs> have been making a big deal about the fact that we've dug in our heels on the principle of firearms. But again, we're a party that's founded on principles. And we have 10 core principles that, uh, that we've described. And, and actually, they're all classically liberal principles. You know, they talk about rights of the individual above groups. It talks of the rights of, uh, of freedom of expression. It talks of the rights of freedom of association. It talks of free trade. All of those good things. And self-defense is crucial to those 10 things. So it's part of our principles. Kelvin, what's interesting about your party is the way that, you know, you guys, the, the, the 10 people involved have come together, right? Um, and I avoid using the term leadership because that's a term you, av you know, avoid yes. using, using mm -hmm. as well. Um, but let's call, let's call you the founders of the party, right? And, and, and I've read elsewhere that some of you have not even met in person and some of these, sure. some of these relationships have formed online. And certainly, you know, the launch of your party and, and your strongest presence is on social media. So where are you organing, organizing outside of, of that space? And, and do you have a presence outside of, of Twitter? Oh, substantially. Yeah, very much so. I mean, what, what's essentially happened, consider that we're only four weeks old at this point. Immediately at the point that, uh, that we came out in public, we've had people calling from around the country saying, where do I sign up? And um, we've got uh, incredibly active telegram groups around the country now that have been setting up effective branch structures all around the country. So we've already got volunteers that are doing things like um, you know, uh, monitoring the polling stations on the day, and they've been setting up. Uh, um, we don't have the sort of uh, big budgets that the uh, the major parties have for things like printing posters or distributing leaflets or even printing T-shirts. So we've just put up our uh, all of our artwork on our website, and we've told people print your own T-shirts, print your own leaflets, distribute them, and people have been doing it. 
And at that level, it's utterly fantastic. We've actually struck a chord with people in this country, particularly young people. If you consider right now the average age of our candidates is 35. I'm the oldest of the, of the lot. And as I said, we've, we've struck a chord and people have just been coming forward and saying, we love your ideas, we want to get involved. Of course, the true test is going to come on election day and, uh, and, and we'll find out at that point where the, um, you know, the stuff that we've actually invested our time and money in, because it's, it's been our time and money. We haven't had anyone, th there's no um, funders behind the scenes that are, that are giving us money. In fact, uh, I think most funders are really scared of us. Lastly, can you tell us what is with the purple cow? Oh, don't you love it? <laughs> yes. Cattle is a symbol of wealth in, uh, in uh, most of sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the first point. Then from the point of view of the markets, you know, it represents a bull market. And purple is the color of prosperity, it's the color of royalty. And um, you can never forget a purple cow, as Seth Gordon said. Indeed you can't. Thanks very much for joining us, Kenton. I appreciate your time. Absolute pleasure.